Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. And today, we are talking about what happens when all the player characters decide to draw their bows and take to the wilderness by playing rangers in D&D 5e. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. Rangers are all about exploration, but before we jump into this week's video, let's talk about the deadliest place to explore, the city of Drakenheim. Our new project is now live on Kickstarter, Monsters of Drakenheim, which is a 5e compatible book filled with over 150 brand new monsters inspired by eldritch horror and dark fantasy. Rangers are masters of the hunt, and the shattered ruins of Drakenheim are the perfect place to seek the deadliest prey known to adventurers. The eldritch horrors and monsters that stalk the streets of the ruins of Drakenheim are getting expanded like never before. Any ranger can tell you that the key to defeating the most dangerous prey is to know your foe, which is why every monster entry that we've written for our book is packed with monster knowledge tables, detailed lore, as well as all the things that your characters need to survive and thrive by harvesting the body parts of your fallen foes and using them to craft magical weapons, armor, potions, and scrolls. We've created a brand new crafting system that is perfect for rangers trying to survive in the field who don't have time for downtime, gold piece costs, and skill checks. Instead, they need to harvest the materials they need, take them to the right place, to forge their workshop, and get new weapons and armor that they can take right to the field. We're also introducing brand new deadly conditions that are going to make your combat encounters more tactical and more interesting. On top of that, we are going to have ready-to-run layers for your monsters to jump into with adventure hooks and possible ideas for DMs to inspire adventures or even entire campaigns around the monsters in this book. Our Kickstarter project is off to an amazing start, but we need more support to unlock even more stretch goals so we can add even more monsters and accessories to this project. You can find the links right down below. The Kickstarter project is live until the, the final week of April, so follow those links down below and help support our project it helps support everything we do here on the channel. And now, let's actually talk about what would happen if we all played Rangers. As with the rest of the videos in this series, the rules that we're following is that we are going to build a party of four. They all have to be Rangers. They cannot be the same subclass as each other, and we will not be talking about multi-classing. We're going to take a look at how Rangers perform in all pillars of play from combat, exploration, and social. We're going to go through what subclasses Kelly and I would choose. We're going to discuss their strengths, their weaknesses, how we might build this, this party, as well as how it stacks up against all, all the other single class parties that we've looked at so far. But first, let's get a little bit inspired and look at the style points. What would be the theme of an all ranger campaign? And I, I gotta say, the first thing that comes to my mind is the commando spec op squad. Yes, I think your special ops unit, because rangers to me feel like they could be very military in, yeah. in the way that they're organized. They're very good at exploration and sort of the stealthy but not in the same way a rogue is stealthy they're not assassins they're just going through the wilderness giving hand signals to one another finding their targets ambushing them i think the the special ops is a really good way to go and yeah and i think that the first thing that pops into my head when you think of special ops in a setting that involves monsters i like the idea of doing a predator campaign yes i also thought also on the alien sort of theme, you could look at like the colonial marines from Alien or uh, the marines from XCOM. Because I think what's kind of interesting about the mix of rangers, when you compare them to a lot of other classes, is that they are they do kind of sit in this trifecta of a little bit of fighter, a little bit of druid, and a little bit of rogue. So they've got stealth, but unlike a rogue that, as you said, is operating as an assassin where they want to slit the throats and get out of there and never be seen, I think the rangers are using stealth to bring the battle to the enemy, but rangers do like hit-and-run tactics, but they don't necessarily need to be completely unseen and completely undetected during the ambush. It's almost like the rangers 
are okay with the more explosive battle. They're just using stealth to get close and to get away. But when the actual battle is happening, you know it's happening. They want the combat to start on their terms, but they're yes. ready to throw down when the combat breaks out. Yeah, and I think that the survival element of Rangers actually means that they can win a battle of attrition by utilizing hit-and-run tactics. Um, and so I think you see that a lot with that kind of military style where it's like, yeah, we're going to hit the base, then we're going to retreat, but then we're going to hit them again in an hour, we're going to hit over here, and eventually they've dismantled the entire opposition and are ready to claim the territory and move along. I think it's really interesting when we talk about the fantasy of rangers. A lot of rangers use bows, some of them are going to have swords and, and whatnot, but there's something that relates to popular media that involves guns. I don't yeah, know why, but... Yeah, there is. There if, totally is. If they're in an undead campaign, I feel like we're in, like, Walking Dead or The Last of Us territory. We could do a Wild West campaign with yes! rangers. Oh, yeah, the Lone Ranger, yeah. right? Except it, it's, it, well, you could even do like- The Lone Four, right? Yeah, but, or you even think of like movies like The Wild Bunch or any of those like classic Westerns where you've got the Desperados that are either doing kind of the roadside heist, they're doing the train heist. And you think about a lot of those things where like, you know, they've got the hidden Gatling gun or the traps that they've set up. And I think that feels a lot more rangery than rogue to me, although there is ab absolutely a little bit of overlap. Yeah. Um, now, one of the other, obviously, we got to talk about the fact that, like, the trope namer is the Lord of the Rings rangers. And so you have Striders rangers, but also the groups of elven rangers. So you could actually have, like, the all elf, all ranger party and that kind of be your squad. I think that you definitely see, though, even in the elf rangers and the sort of the gondor rangers or the classic lord of the rings rangers you do still see like this military survivalist trope here like they are the guardians of a certain area and they are using these kind of skirmish guerrilla tactics to fight against a much more superiorly equipped foe yeah aragorn constantly is using tactics to track to hunt and is versatile in his weapon choices as well yeah which I always found fascinating. And I, I mean, Aragorn is our poster child ranger, I think, for a lot of people. Yes, alongside Legolas, although lots of people like to argue that they're really another class. And, and I don't think that I don't think we can really separate the fact that, again, even though we might argue that Aragorn is more better represented with another class, just like Gandalf might not actually be a wizard in the D and D sense. They're still called rangers and wizards in the book by Tolkien, so it's hard to over overstate that that word association has informed the overall trope, right? By the same token, one of my favorite series. I'm, I'm not a huge anime watcher, but I absolutely loved Attack on Titan. And for me, the Scout Regiment from Attack on Titan is a huge amount of inspiration for the urban rangers that inhabit the world of Drakenheim. Um, I and that is where once again you kind of see this highly mobile fighting force that is capable of using terrain to their advantage. They do use a bit of stealth and they do use a lot of intelligence in the way they fight, but ultimately they have to be able to fight that pitched battle in some sort of way shape or form and so i think that with with rangers you actually end up with this really diverse range of what they can take on and i think we'll get to this towards the end of the episode but i think that with every sort of party that we've looked at so far there's been something where oh they're really gonna struggle with that and i don't know if the rangers are gonna struggle with anything they might not spike in the same way as other parties do in a certain pillar totally like but the, they're good and everything yeah the paladins are going to slam dunk against demons and undead the rangers are not going to be slouches there right um and much in the same sense that i think that rangers are going to be able to handle a lot of skill based and exploration scenarios maybe not as well as say the group of druids can or the group of rogues can but they're going to be able to accomplish the job uh, and I and I think that that really might be the clincher of like why this party might be one of the best ones. Let's let's build up to that because yeah. that will be a section that we're talking about. But as we jump into the subclasses, one thing that I want to point out is the Rangers may have possibly gotten 
the most help, I'd say, along with sorcerers. Yeah. And maybe warlocks. But those three, to me, are the classes that have gotten the most help through the lifespan of 5th edition. Rangers started 5th edition in not the greatest place. They were deemed one of the weakest classes in the game. But we've seen alternate rules come out, as well as some really phenomenal subclasses. So for... For all of the rangers that we're talking about today, we're looking at the alternate rules that were introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And if we talk about the Beastmaster, we're definitely talking about the Beastmaster that was adapted in Tasha's Cauldron. Yes. And as we do get into the subclasses, we're pretty much mostly focusing on newer subclasses. Newer being not the player's yeah, handbook. Yeah, for sure. And I think that there is a lot to say about the base ranger class that sets it up for success and has really taken these new features and elevated. First of all, Ranger's primary ability scores are Dexterity and Wisdom, which I think are widely regarded as two of the strongest and most versatile ability scores in the game. Not only do a ton of abilities target these as saving throws, so having them strong is a big advantage, but it tends to be that the Dexterity-based skills and the Wisdom-based skills come up time and time again, whether that's perception and stealth, or the fact that dexterity is kind of this omni stat in that it is used for a bunch of useful skills, it also adds to your AC, it also adds to your initiative, and it's also used for both ranged and melee weapon attacks with, with finesse weapons. So rangers are kind of stacked out the gate just by the ability scores that they have, but it goes further than that because when you step back and look at the ranger class, even before we get to the subclasses, it does actually have everything. It's got the same hit die as fighters. They have a lot of versatility in what position they can take. They get medium armor and shields. They don't get heavy armor, but we're dexterity-based characters, so I think that's fine. And they also have magic, so really they're, they kind of can fill many different roles depending on how you build them and part of building them is going to be picking your subclasses and i don't think we're going to surprise anybody with our first choice yeah i i think the gloom stalker you were who was expecting it if you commented before this already you got it right i bet they're going to pick the gloom stalker yeah, yeah you got yeah, us you got us you got us uh, uh and i think we're going to go with the full classic Archer, Gloomstalker. So this is going to be your crossbow expert, sharpshooter, who is just going to, you know, slam the hammer on that uh, that hand crossbow and shoot down anybody that comes in front of the party. I think that's our best bet. I will say that you're going to notice that there's not a lot that we've given to uh, two-handed fighting, and I actually think the Gloomstalker might be a cool option for that. I would still go with the sharpshooter oh, yeah. crossbow expert, but there is a case that if you're in darkness, you can still sneak up on people and murder I, them with yeah. two weapons. I just think that Dread Ambusher and the, the fact that the Gloomstalker has dark vision and inherently and also is invisible to other creatures in dark vision plus its other spell list kind of options it gets some really useful things in there like rope trick and disguise self it's such a powerful subclass yeah and even when and well you see a lot of people just take five levels of gloomstalker ranger and then move into something else it stays pretty strong through there and i i think it's it's just going to kind of be this damage dealing rock of the entire party. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think Gloomstalker is a must have. Uh, and, and the next one that we're going to throw in here, I think it's a very important pick for an all ranger party. And that's going to be the Fey Wanderer. Yeah. So the Fey Wanderer is a new subclass that was introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And I think the thing that really makes it stand out is. First of all, it gets some really cool spells in the form of Misty Step and Charm Person and Dimension Door added to the Ranger spell list, but it also incentivizes a character going high with Wisdom because the Fey Wanderer is able to add their Wisdom bonus to their Charisma checks and gets an additional proficiency in a, in a Charisma-based skill. This, this goes against the whole argument that Rangers excel at everything except the social pillar of play, yeah. but a Fey Wanderer helps so much with that. And I think that's why we need them in the party. Not only that, but I think the Fey Wanderer might be our tank. Interesting that Rangers can tank, but if we give them medium armor, a shield, 
we give them the druidic warrior fighting style and give them a uh a staff a quarter staff and give them shillelagh and maybe guidance yeah because yeah. there because there you go there's the first thing is that we just snuck guidance into this party too yeah yeah so between guidance shillelagh a shield and armor they can be up on the front lines smacking people with their magic stick and when it comes to social encounters, they're the face of the party. They're the one who's going to do all the talking. Or they can yeah. help out other people with talking through guidance, or they can get enhance ability. And on the battlefield as well, I think that because they're going to be focusing on their wisdom over their dexterity, this character is actually going to be able to take some of the ranger spells and use them more effectively. So they're going to be able to use spells like Entangle, or they will have the ranger summon spells, which we'll talk about more in a moment. This is going to be key to our strategy, which their summons are going to be stronger. They're going to be more accurate. They're going to have higher DCs. Something that you don't often encounter with rangers who often don't. Rangers usually do invest in a good wisdom score, but we're going to go all the way with this and make wisdom the highest stat for the Fey Wanderer. We're going to leave the dexterity at 14 because we're going to wear the medium armor and use a shield, but we're still going to have a good AC. And then we can build our con up from there as well and maybe take some other feats like Fey Touched or Shadow Touched to augment the spellcasting element of the Fey Wanderer. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting choice for our subclasses is one that will both work as a tank and ranged combatant because... We're talking about the Drake Warden. You're going to have a dragon. A dragon can run up with the Fey Wander and be on the front lines. I would give my Drake Warden, they want to use their bonus action to control the dragon. So we don't want to give them uh, the crossbow experts that they're shooting twice. But we still want to give them a longbow because at higher levels, they're going to be riding the dragon and firing yes. down. Yes. I think that the Drake Warden is a great uh, a great option as well for another like switch hitter type character. The again, as you mentioned, the only thing is that their bonus action is so often going to be going to be used to command what their companion is doing. So it makes it hard for us to dual wield or use crossbow expert in that respect. If the rules get modified, maybe we'll be able to do that and still do, do that too. Um, in any case, this brings an extra body on the board that is there all the time. And I would be tempted at this point to take our four person party to a six from five to six by adding a Beastmaster Ranger and kind of just doubling up on the Drake Warden um, with with what the Beastmaster offers us. But I think that there's another subclass that just brings some really critical utility that I don't know if I want to pass up on it. And that is the Swarm Keeper. I think the Beastmaster is right if you want to play the Entourage of Companions. Yeah. But the Swarm Keeper offers us something very interesting in play, and that is forced movement. The Swarm Keeper has this nice little ability to push targets 15 feet, which pairs really well with a whole party that can lay down spike rope. Yes. And with a party that in general wants to be at range most of the time. This way you've got somebody that can push enemies back and keep them at bay. And the Swarm Keeper as well comes with their own flying speed. So they're really good as well. Again, the Swarm Keeper is another character where we can very comfortably go crossbow expert, sharpshooter, take to the sky and just lay down the covering fire for the rest of the group. So I really do like this idea of having a Swarm Keeper and a Gloomstalker. Both of them are going to be crossbow experts. They're they're in the back. Yeah. We have a Drake Warden also kind of mid-ranged with a dragon up front with the Fey Wanderer. Yeah. So uh, yeah. we kind of have, yeah, we have, we have people everywhere that can operate. I, I think our Drake Warden is our switch hitter. They might have a sword or two on their side. So Everyone's going to carry two swords, yeah, yeah. just for style points, right? Um, and I, I think beyond the subclasses, I think the spells really round out this group because rangers do have to choose the, what spells they know, so they can be kind of limited here. But I think that for everybody, like, we can get Cure Wounds in this party. We can get everybody with Absorb Elements, which will really help against magic damage. We can pull in rangers had Entangle and Enhance Ability and aid and revivify added to their spell list in Tasha's, which gives them a fantastic kit where we can have somebody enhance ability on a, on a character, throw in guidance, and really nail those skill checks, especially if we're using the alternative class features that allow rangers to get climb speeds 
as well as expertise and skill. So we're going to have no problem between our spell casting, guidance, enhanceability, and access to expertise, which is nailing those skill challenges. We're going to have some recovery in the form of cure wounds and revivify and lesser restoration. And then we get into all the ways that we can use our magic offensively. And that's where we are going to talk about the three pillars of play. First off is combat. And I think, again, it's important to note that we rangers take a lot from the fighter. They get multi-attack. They have enough hit points. They can wear armor. They can have shields. They're really good with bows, but they also have magic. And so I think that they excel in combat, actually. they Oh, yeah. They can sneak up on the enemy, surround them, and then hop in and just start unleashing. Your basic approach with this party is someone's going to cast Pass Without Trace. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to let you all get into ambush positions. You've got so many people that can cast it that you're going to be able to do this as a setup maneuver almost every time. And you're just going to get into that position. And then you're going to move on from Pass Without Trace into unleashing opening fire and probably using the ranger summoning spells to put more bodies on the board. You send in the dragon, send in the summons, send in the fey wanderer, and the rest spray arrows yeah. from the tree line. Yeah, and you've got climb speeds all around because of the alternative class features by mid-levels of play. So people can climb up into advantageous positions and rain down their shots, even if they're not going to be flying. Can rangers gain access to either the message cantrip or telepathic bond? They have animal messenger. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so there's a few techniques that you could use here, but you could also just be coordinated. It, it would really help if someone could create a telepathic bond in the party. Yeah. Maybe someone does just take ritual caster so that you've got that on on its own. That way we can all be like, all right, I'm flanking left. Yes. Or, yeah. Oh, so good for the commando feel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I like it. I like it a lot. Um, I think that the the summoning spells too from summon beast. Summon Fey, Conjure Animals, Conjure Woodland Beings. We've got Summon Elemental. Um, yes, it's tempting for everyone to just drop Hunter's Mark, but I think in the All Ranger Party, you might find that you're relying on Hunter's Mark a lot less and really more focused on bringing out those really useful summons because if every one of the Rangers summons an extra beast, you've just taken your four-person party plus the, the dragon into a nine-person, like you've got nine bodies on the board. They're summons. So if they die, it doesn't really matter what happens to them. And yeah, they're not going to be the robust, most robust thing in the world, but they're taking up space. They're blocking choke points. They're distracting enemies while you're getting into position. And there's so many useful ways that you can use those types of things when you're combining them with ambush tactics. Uh, a hit against a summon is damage that the party doesn't have to take. Yeah. That's the way I always look at it. And And I think that one of the advantages that the rangers have, as opposed to other, many other summoners is that the ranger is still a ranger that is got sharpshooter and crossbow expert and does a lot of damage themselves yeah a lot of other summoner type characters i'm thinking things like shepherd druids or conjurer wizards when they're concentrating on their summon kind of they're bringing their utility magic which can be useful or they're sending out cantrips whereas with the rangers they're just tossing they're just shooting arrows um, and moving into this position. And yeah, they might have some of the utility magic on the board there as well. But that effect, that combined effect, really acts as a force multiplier in, in this case, especially because a bunch of the summon spells last an hour as well. I think that they can really crash through a bunch of encounters using this. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that as we move to the next pillar of play, exploration, uh, the rangers the rangers we got pass without trace we got stealth we got speak with plants we yep. have speak with animals yes we do and um these like animal messenger we can climb we can we have great perception so between our skills and our spells 
Rangers are fine. In yeah, it, it, it's going to be really easy across the party for stealth and acrobatics to be present, athletics to be present. We're going to have high perception across the board. We're going to have good insight as well. We can have survival and you can diversify the party with some extra knowledge skills as well. It's going to be tempting with this party for everybody to dump intelligence. Um, so you're, but Rangers have a, a cool way of compensating for that with their class features when it comes to those knowledge and investigation checks. And so you can diversify your favorite enemies and your favorite foes across there. Um, and maybe utilize a mixture of, of some people doing the, the, it, it, it really depends on where you want to do the alternative class features or not. But I, I, I generally think I would go for them across the board. I also think it's tough that, uh, you know, it, investigation is something that we use a lot, but survival should be the skill that you're using if you're specifically tracking something. Yeah, yeah. And they're going to be great at survival. They, th This party in general, yeah. I mean, I, again, it's one of those things where it kind of goes without saying, like, yes, they're fantastic at, at it. I think that in terms of exploration as well, as soon as you when we come back to the fact that this is also a party that in addition to having really good skills has enhance ability and has guidance access in in the party as well so they're able to kind of pull the playbook from both the clerics and the bards and a little like it it really is like wow yeah and, right and that combination of guidance and enhance ability carries us over also to the social pillar Yes, it does, because the Fey Wanderer is going to be able to take advantage of those for those really hard social encounters. The Gloomstalker even has disguised self and seeming. Which I would give them advantage on certain roles yeah. if they are disguised yeah. as somebody who should be able to talk. Like, yeah. So there are tools. Yeah. And well, again, are they the best at the social pillar? No. It's the weakest of the three. It, it, it certainly is, but they, they have competence here. And they, they're going to be able to have a party face acting on, on their behalf. And so I, I think you've kind of got all your bases covered here. Um, combat's amazing. Exploration is incredible. Um, social is fine. Yeah, social is fine. So when we come to the strengths and weaknesses of this party, I think we've been clear on the strengths. Like, you have a ton of summons that you can throw in. You're all going to be good at damage dealing. You really... We said it earlier, but the Rangers are very versatile. They can fill almost any role. And with the combination of being good in combat, having magic, having good skills, uh, there really isn't a part of D&D &D that they can't at least solve the problem of. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing here is ranged attacks are really good. Uh, and when you have a bunch of party members that can deliver the mail downtown uh, and throw down big numbers with sharpshooter and crossbow expert, it really means that like whatever the the priority target is, is going to die. And and in a way that is very different from other parties that rely on that sort of precision damage, because ranged attacks don't care about mobility. They don't necessarily care about positioning. Yes, there are ways that ranged attacks can be foiled by certain things, but these accurate, constant barrages of ranged attacks really... I, I It just can't be understated how effective it is in most combat scenarios. I actually think that this is a party that maybe the Drake Warden, maybe one other ranger... Might want to actually take that feat that lets you pick a second fighting style. Yeah. So that they have archery and something to excel in their melee combat so that they can be the switch hitters. So that if an enemy yeah. does get close, the Gloomstalker and the Swarmkeeper fall back. But if the Fey Wanderer and the Drake Warden can both fire arrows and then switch to their blades and go yeah. in... I think I think that's amazing. And we've got some cool solutions in here as well, because a common thing to de defeat ranged attacks is invisible enemies. But our Fey Wanderer brings fairy fire. Yeah. Which also sets up advantage at range for everybody in the party too. So they, they're able to paint the target for the rest of the archers, and they're going to take them down pretty quickly. I I think that the D10 hit die combined with the good armor proficiencies also means that this group isn't going to crumple and die 
when they face some stiff opposition. Yeah. We talked about this with the rogues, where the rogues are really on the knife's edge when it comes to being reliant on sneak attack, being reliant on that positioning stuff. And when they can't get that, they're really, really going to struggle. But the rangers don't have that problem because they're not reliant on sneak attack to deliver a fistful of dice under sp particular circumstances. The rangers are just attacking on, on, on fair terms like the fighters are. I think the big difference is that when we look at rogues, rogues need to gain the surprise ambush and want 90% of targets dead by the end of that first round of combat. Yeah. The rangers want to explode into a combat with surprise and then can stand toe to toe with the enemies that are there for as long as the battle needs to take. Yes, and the rangers kind of have this buffer in the form of their summons and animal companions that the rogues don't because the range because again, I am thinking of the scenario where the rangers are using their climb speed from the alternative class feature to climb up into a vantage point where they can make their ranged attacks and they're summoning the animals down there. So and because of things like Pass Without Trace and their exploration abilities, the rangers can reliably scout an area and find those vantage points and make sure they're engaging on their terms yeah. in a way that I don't think the rogues can. I, do, I, I, just, I don't know if the rogues keep up with that to the same degree because they don't have that extra element of magic to sort of make the traps. Here's the hardest question of this whole episode. What's their weakness? They don't have any real defensive boosts right they they basically they get what you get from armor and shields yes. and only one of them in our list is going to have a shield yes and because rangers innately want a good dexterity and they want a good wisdom and they want a good con they're going to have their three most important saving throws are going to be decent but they're not going to be invulnerable um, they don't have counterspell. We can get the spell magic from the Fey Wanderer. And so they really do rely on target prioritization. And they do have absorb elements to bail them out if they get breath weapon. I don't think the Rangers are going to have a lot of capacity to crank their ACs over 20. They're not really going to be able to make their saving throws any better than their baseline. And they're not really going to have any sort of other special defensive tricks aside from those granted by their subclasses. They're relying on the tools at their disposal to help them out, but anything beyond yeah. that, it, they have a lot of tools for, for upping damage, for mitigating damage in other ways by like battlefield control. But when push comes to shove, they're hoping their armor and shields hold out. Yeah, and they do have battlefield control. Like they've got Entangle, our yeah. party will have web. They've got spike growth. Uh, the Gloomstalker has fear. Um, yeah. And we do have some teleportation magic as well from the expanded spell lists. So, so I'd say really even the, their their weakness, they have a lot of ways of helping out with that. So yeah, I I think that defensively speaking, it, it it's very interesting because like if you compare them say to the wizards, the wizards have all these spells that can crank their defenses up when they need them but the wizards actually have a pretty poor baseline level of defenses the rangers have a better baseline on their own defenses but that's all it's ever going to be yeah and the rangers then have they do have weaker battlefield control compared to our other classes but they compensate for that weaker battlefield control with their much better damage output Right. Right. So the Rangers only need to hamper their enemies long enough to kill them. Right. And they're going to be able to do that. Whereas, say, the, the Bards or the, the Wizards, they just really want to lock down the opposition so they can slowly dismantle them. Whereas the Rangers just need to kind of slow you down and kite you. And that, that's the other thing that the Rangers can do with, with all the things that they can do to create difficult ground and the fact they have these ranged attacks, the mobility and the speed. They could just kite. But again, if they have an enemy that can close that, they're, they're, that that's kind of it. I still think uh, when we come to looking at them overall compared to all the other classes, I think this might be an S tier. I'm surprised to say, but I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, when you compare it to some of the top groups that we looked at, when we looked at, say, the Paladins, do the paladins do more damage than the rangers? Probably. 
when they're smiting. Yeah. Uh, but not necessarily all the time. And the paladins are reliant on melee for that. Whereas the rangers are really, really ranged heavy. And I think ranged is better than melee, just flat out, right? I think that they do better damage than the bards and the 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 wizard. Like they do better. Da- I think that we've got the best damage here because it is high quality range damage. Yeah, I do think that there are some other parties that can really put it out, but I feel like there are other parties there that fall lower in some places and spike higher in others. Yeah. But the rangers are almost a flat line. And the flat line is in a high place that basically says it doesn't matter what is being thrown at you, they're, yeah. they're going to handle it. Yeah. And so do I give the Rangers the gold medal in any single category? No. But because they get high marks across the board and then don't have a glaring weakness, they, they do have healing. They've got Revivify. They've got Lesser Restoration. You know, and whereas the Paladins, they didn't have nearly the skills or the exploration capabilities that the Rangers did. Yeah. Right. The Bards totally dominate social interaction and have great control in combat and really good skill use, but the, they kind of don't have the damage that the Rangers do. And so you look at every trade off that we've looked at with all the other parties, and I don't feel like we're making that trade off with the Rangers. I don't think that we, we have that downside. I'm I'm surprised because the Rangers have been in a tough place for a lot of the yeah. career of 5e, but I actually think the all ranger party is excellent and can yeah. can really perform and yeah, I'm I really think, proud of Rangers. Yeah, I think that if you were going into a tournament and everybody had to play the same class, you didn't know what kind of scenarios you were going to be running into, but you knew that your party had to make it through four to six encounters. I really think that the ranger is strongly favored. Yeah. In 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 under those sorts slow of and steady wins the race. Yeah. I don't even think they're slow and steady either. I think they tear through a bunch of encounters by simply being so efficient with the resources. This is actually another point for them over the other parties. I think that their use of summoning spells and long duration buffs mean that unlike the paladins who are blowing through spell slots, and the wizards are too, and the bards are too, everybody's blowing through the spell slots, but the rangers are like, yeah, we got the skills and damage. We're going to use the spell that matters most. If you have a party of four, each of them needs to cast one long lasting spell in combat and that combat's good. Yeah. And then all of the one spell slot per combat encounter from each of them. So they're highly efficient with, with how they approach things. Uh, because once they have that spell down, they're just going back to their own attacks and skills. Yeah, I'll, so, I'll say not slow and steady, but consistency is, yeah. is what and and, is what and works consistency here. is key. I I really think that this is a winning party, and and I think that the the scenarios that you could play with them of like the XCOM, the Commando sort of raid style, uh, or the Wilderness Survival, like drawing that inspiration from real world militaries or survivalist organizations. I love the idea of Rangers in the Zombie Apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah. I also love like they they could make a really compelling campaign for a world that is unexplored, yes. and they are the crew sent out to the great wild, yeah, uh, the yeah. wild beyond, and then they they have to map it and navigate and find out what's out there. Yeah, I mean, it kind of comes back to that trope of like you know how in every Elder Scrolls games you want to play something else, but you always end up playing the stealth archer. Yes, yeah, like the stealth archer is a really strong archetype. And when you have an entire group of them, you're kind of like, what else do I need? Like I can, uh, the stealth archer is so good in the Elder Scrolls games because it is able to tackle so many different things in that way. And I think that the Rangers have a further advantage here in that they're not super squishy. And just like in Skyrim, if you're a high enough level Ranger, you can crouch and sneak up right in front of a dragon's face and poke it with your dagger and it dies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can do that, but I I, I love doing that in Skyrim. I I do think, you know, we do have the access to some invisibility and Patch Without Trace. You're going to get close. Yeah. Right? I love this party. I would play this. So, 
If you either disagree with us or if you love these ideas, uh, tell us about your dreams for an All Ranger party in the comments below. And don't forget, the Kickstarter campaign for our latest book, Monsters of Drakenheim, is now live on Kickstarter. If you want to get 150 new monsters inspired by Elder Tor for your games, you can follow the links down in the description below to back the campaign while it's live. And we unlocked a stretch goal that's going to mean there's a lot more Ranger NPC stat blocks available in that book. <laughs> and if you want to see a ranger in action, you can check out our actual play in the Worlds of Draconheim, which airs Tuesday evenings right here on YouTube. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more videos in our series on what if everyone plays the same class right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.